I've written a number of books, and this is my first to have been translated in Korean. This is called The Age of the Platform, How Apple, Amazon, Facebook, and Google Have Redefined Business. And I like to do something when I'm speaking to large groups of people. So I would like everyone to just stand up briefly. You won't be standing for very long. As I said, this is a little bit of an experiment. Have a seat if you use any products or services from Amazon. Kindle, Amazon.com. OK, a lot of people standing. I'm going to get a bunch of you with the next one. Sit down if you use any products from Apple. iPad, iPod, MacBook Pro. OK, got a few of you. Those of you standing, are you among the 11 million South Koreans on Facebook? If you are, have a seat. OK. Is it just one? No, two, three, OK. For those of you who are standing up, do you use Google? If you do, have a seat. Wow. We got everyone? OK, it looks like we got you. So I find it interesting. As someone who writes and speaks a great deal about technology, what's so interesting about these companies? And that's essentially this book in a nutshell. But today, I'm going to focus on just two aspects of companies like Amazon, Apple, Facebook, Google, Twitter, social media, and cloud computing. By way of background, I live in Las Vegas, Nevada, and I get to write and speak for a living. I've written five books about business and technology. My new book will be out in early February of 2014 about data visualization. As I said, The Age of the Platform was recently translated into Korean. And my new book is about big data. And that will be out in South Korean in probably early 2014. So we have a couple topics today. First is cloud computing. For those of you who sat down, and I think we got all of you, you're using the cloud whether you know it or not. Social media, I didn't realize that 11 million South Koreans were on Facebook alone. Show of hands, just out of curiosity, how, how many of you are on Twitter? If you are, raise your hand. OK, a few, a few. And I hope that we have time for questions about technology, business, big data, whatever you like. First up, cloud computing. In reality, cloud computing has been around for over 30 years, but we're starting to hear a great deal about it now. There is a great deal of buzz about cloud computing. So just what exactly is it? There really isn't a commonly accepted definition of the term cloud computing. A lot of consulting firms, a lot of software vendors, a lot of technology talking heads like me propose different definitions of the term. And in my books, I really don't try to focus on the one right definition of cloud computing. The important thing is what cloud computing means to billions of people. And that is, you have the ability to access your data and your apps no matter where you go. I was listening to Jason's speech before about something like 90% of internet traffic be but mobile related. All of that is possible through the cloud. I've been in Seoul. This is my first time here for around 36 hours. And as I walk around, it reminds me a lot of the United States because people are often doing this. All of that is possible through cloud computing. Does anyone here use Netflix? Show of hands. OK. Some people. Netflix has about 35 million subscribers. And around 2007, Netflix, you may remember, used to send <coughs> DVDs in the mail. At one point, at least in the United States, Netflix was probably the largest purchaser of postage stamps and services. In 2007, though, Netflix began the transformation into streaming video. 
So if you didn't like something, you didn't need to send it back. You would just click stop. So Netflix runs off of cloud services. And the things that Netflix knows about its users are amazing. I'll just leave it at that for now. Many people don't realize, however, that behind the scenes, Netflix relies upon another company that some of you have heard of, Amazon. Amazon Web Services is by itself approximately a $4 billion a year business and growing. The theme of this conference is creativity. The story behind Amazon Web Services is actually fascinating. At some point in 2006 or 2007, somebody realized that the data centers powering Amazon were generating excess compute power. In other words, Amazon didn't need everything that it was producing. Now, at many companies, they wouldn't think twice about it, right? But someone at Amazon had a crazy idea of saying, well, what if we sold it? Six years later, we have a $4 billion business. With regard to Netflix, Amazon is powering the vast majority of its infrastructure. In December of 2012, in the United States and other countries, I would imagine, <coughs> Twitter started blowing up with Netflix mentions. Netflix wasn't working. It turns out that many people, like yourselves, went home to see their parents. And they didn't want to talk to their parents. They wanted to watch videos. But Netflix was down. Netflix was down because there was a problem with Amazon Web Services. Of course, most people didn't realize that. But that reflects the extent to which Amazon Web Services has a foothold in the enterprise. As I said, many people are using it without even knowing that. Now, Netflix and Amazon are both multi-billion dollar companies. So the cloud is just for big companies, right? Absolutely not. My third book is called The New Small, How a New Breed of Small Businesses is Harnessing the Power of Emerging Technologies. And in the book, I wrote about 11 small businesses, anywhere from 5 to 10 or 20 employees, many of whom used different cloud services. One of my favorite quotes in the book, and talking about creativity, is from the head of a law firm. And I asked him, who's your head of IT? And he said, I don't know. It's probably me today. That's not your average company. But the cloud enables that type of flexibility. What does a law firm really know about running servers, about databases? Probably not that much. Hopefully, they know more about the law, right? And that's where lawyers should probably spend their time, not trying to figure out how to configure their systems and their email. And these days, most startups embrace cloud computing. In Las Vegas, where I live, in addition to many other cities in the world, there are many startups. Does anyone here work for a startup? OK, a few hands. I would be shocked if those of you who work at startups have spent hundreds of thousands or millions of dollars buying your own infrastructure. It just doesn't make a great deal of sense, which is really one of the main benefits of cloud computing. You're talking about a fraction of the cost. Many companies don't want to spend that type of money from the beginning. But if things start to explode and they need to purchase more compute power, it's a click of a mouse or it's a phone call. You don't have to call IT. You don't have to roll up your hands. It's become very easy for businesses to focus on their business. As a result, many applications can be deployed almost instantly. The impact of and speed of cloud services is very difficult to overestimate. It used to take months or years to deploy applications. By way of background, I spent about 10 years as a consultant, going to different companies in mostly the United States, helping them implement systems. Most of those projects failed. They didn't give employees. <coughs> the functionality expected. They took longer than expected. They cost more money than expected. And I joke with people that if I didn't write my first book, I would have needed to see a psychiatrist. So the cloud allows companies to deploy applications faster. Does anyone here work from home? Show of hands. A few people? Okay. 
it's becoming increasingly common, at least in the United States, for people to work from home. Why? In many instances, that's because of cloud computing. 15 years ago, when I first started working in a corporate environment, you really couldn't work from home. You would have to drive in the office, even if you had to do something that took five minutes. These days, and as I write about in my third book, The New Small, certain companies are what they call distributed. In other words, people work from anywhere. When you log into Facebook, for those of you joining, you may notice certain features. You don't have to download anything, right? This isn't iOS, so the latest version of Android. Those features just appear. Imagine if 1.2 billion users, although I don't really trust that number, <coughs> had to download the same piece of software. Do you think Facebook would be as popular? Certainly wouldn't help. The cloud provides for incredible flexibility. Think about it. If you don't need to spend a great deal of money on an IT department, where could you spend that money? Maybe on marketing, maybe on new products, maybe on innovation, maybe, as Charles said, on failing faster and taking advantage of some of those things. One of my favorite quotes, though, is from a guy named Melvin Kranzberg, who once said, technology is neither good nor bad, nor is it neutral. So yes, there are tremendous benefits to cloud computing, but there are also some concerns and risks. Sometimes the cloud goes down. Remember what I said before about Netflix? People were mad at Netflix, when in really, they should have been mad at Amazon. Sometimes that happens. There's no such thing as 100% uptime. I don't want to bore you with a lot of technical jargon, but if you engage with Amazon or Rackspace or Microsoft through Azure, and you take a look at the terms of service, what techies would call the end user license agreement, or EULA, you will see language in there that doesn't guarantee 100% uptime. I can pretty much guarantee it. So sometimes there are issues with the system being down. Most of the cloud service providers that I mentioned are incredibly secure but that doesn't mean that they're 100% secure. In fact, there is no such thing as 100% security. Even if you keep all of your data on your customers, your employees, in a filing cabinet, in an office, there could be a flood, there could be a theft, there could be a fire. So there's no such thing. Many organizations have deployed what they call legacy applications into the cloud. In my consulting days, I've worked on systems that were 30 years old and should have been retired 27, 28 years ago. There are ways to keep those applications live through the cloud, but they're not always easy. A company like Salesforce.com or Facebook or Google is web native. In other words, they were born when the World Wide Web existed. That's a lot different than if you have a 30-year-old application that was built on a mainframe. Is it possible? Yes, but sometimes there are issues with doing that. It's also important to think about compliance, at least in the United States. Just because you can put your data in the cloud doesn't mean that you necessarily should. Remember, you don't want to get the government and lawyers mad at you. So there are a lot of myths about the cloud. No shortage of definition. But there really is no one cloud. There are private clouds that companies like IBM will sell you that are very expensive and, in theory, more secure. There are more public clouds that other companies will use. And then there are semi-private clouds. So there are different types of clouds. And as a general rule, you tend to get what you pay for. Many people also don't understand that clouds are not elixirs. They don't fix dysfunctional organizational cultures. If you have a problem with your boss, the cloud really doesn't solve that, right? If your competition is destroying you, the cloud may not help. So just because the information is accessible on a mobile device anywhere with an internet connection doesn't mean that information is accurate. I have always said that I will take a simple Microsoft Excel spreadsheet that has accurate data on my desktop, as opposed to something in the cloud that isn't right. How can you make interesting or correct decisions without the right information? 
Some people think that clouds are inherently unsafe or easily hacked, and that's simply not true. Companies like Rackspace, as I said, Microsoft, Amazon, Google, offer military-grade encryption. Can it be hacked? Sure. Is it easy to do? No. So all cloud providers are not created equal. As a general rule, you get what you pay for. If something costs only $10 a month, how can that company spend a great deal of money on security compared to a company that charges 100 okay. Yes, there are limits with budgets. We all don't have as much money as we want. But it's important to consider these types of things when you're looking at different cloud providers. Again, clouds are not always up. There are 365 days in a year. If a cloud provider guarantees 99% uptime, do the math. That's 3.65 days that your system is down. Now, I don't know about you, but if my website's down for 20 seconds, I'm not a happy guy. So imagine having your business applications or not being able to access your data for three days or more. Again, clouds don't necessarily fix what's broken. Many organizations, at least in the United States, have experimented with cloud services, and they've realized that they don't save any money. Why? Because they don't replace anything with the cloud. They just add on to it. It's simple, but that's been a real problem, at least in the States. If you're spending too much money on something, and then you spend money on cloud services as well, you're just spending more. And cloud computing is a fad, a complete myth. I wish I could predict the future. Unfortunately, I can't. I'm the guy who bought Apple's stock when it was near its record high. So I don't have the best track record with predictions. But I would be shocked if in five years we're sitting here and we don't talk about cloud computing anymore. It's too pervasive. It's too cheap. It's too important these days to constantly be connected. So here's some tips if you're thinking about going with a cloud offering. It's important to choose a reputable provider. Again, as a general rule, you get what you play, pay for. It is out, downright silly to ignore any government regulations. Talk to your lawyers first. Okay? Just because you can do something doesn't mean that you should. Right? You don't want to earn the mistrust or distrust of your customers, of your employees, of the government. Not a good idea. And if you're deploying new applications, test them. Okay? You may see immediately the brand new version of Facebook, but I guarantee you that it's been tested on a small sample of the Facebook population before. It's also important to back up your data regularly. What happens if the cloud goes down and your company's launching something? Okay? Data storage is cheap. Backing up your data on a regular basis is just a smart idea. Unfortunately, every time I go to the Apple store in Las Vegas, I'm sitting next to someone who's complaining that she lost all of her email and never backed it up. Does that happen here? It has to. Also, it's important to ensure redundancy. In other words, what happens if a data center goes down? Does your cloud provider have in place a process to route the traffic through a different data center? It should. And finally, if things really get bad, make sure that you have a disaster recovery plan. What happens if you can't get to anything? What are you going to do? One of my favorite expressions is it's better to have it and not need it than to need it and not have it. So the cloud is here to stay. I don't see it going away anytime soon. And although there are some significant drawbacks, in my opinion, the pros outweigh the cons. It's not even close. So cloud computing is a really big deal. And in this book, all of the companies I mentioned use cloud computing to a great extent. Social media is another critical trend. And we saw before with Jason's presentation some amazing examples. I want to take a slightly different look at social media. It is absolutely huge. I was reading a statistic about a year ago that 19% of all minutes spent online were spent on Facebook. One in five minutes, that's astonishing. So what is social media? 
Sites like Facebook and Twitter and LinkedIn and Pinterest allow users to do a number of important things. Number one, they can create online communities. Very simple. It takes, what, two seconds to set up a Facebook page, a Twitter list, a Google circle. And once you've created these communities, which I think is what a lot of the marketers are doing that, that Jason mentioned, you can share relevant information with them. Ideas, messages, photos, videos, other content. And then hopefully, they'll share it with their friends. I love this notion that Jason mentioned of one to one to many. Sometimes you release a video and it goes viral, right? The Gangnam video, what did that hit? A billion views, okay? But for every Gangnam video with a billion views, there are millions of videos that never get more than a handful of views. I watched a TED Talk a couple of months ago and it showed the distribution of views for videos and most videos barely register. Chris Anderson wrote a book about this called The Long Tail. For every best-selling movie that you see in these theaters, for every best-selling book, like hopefully mine will be one day, in reality, thousands or tens of thousands of movies or books or songs don't go anywhere. Okay. Oh. The gorilla in the room in social media is Facebook with roughly 1.2 billion users. Now, I don't think that number is real. You're not going to get in trouble, but does anyone here have more than one Facebook account? I do. Anybody else? Okay, a few. So I have one for me, and then I have one to test issues. Right? And also, what constitutes an active user? Are you active if you log in once a day? Okay, I'll buy that. What about once a week? Once a month? once a year. All of these companies have an incentive to inflate their numbers. But Facebook is clearly very important. And if you're interested, probably the best book out there on Facebook, I believe it has been translated into Korean, is called The Facebook Effect by David Kirkpatrick. Excellent book. Show of hands, who's seen the movie The Social Network? Okay, a lot of people. Similar to the book. Twitter, another huge social network, roughly 400 million users. Twitter recently announced plans to go public, and the valuation will be roughly $10.5 billion. Twitter is incredibly powerful. And when we talk here about the um, theme of creativity and innovation at the conference, if you take a look inside Twitter, Twitter is remarkable in its use of people like you, its ecosystem, its users. People don't realize that the initial incarnation of Twitter didn't ship with the retweet button. That came from somebody out there, someone named Chris Messina, who said, wouldn't it be easy to have a button that let me retweet something? Okay, that came from someone like you. Also, has anyone heard of a hashtag? Please say yes. Okay, again, the hashtag did not come from Twitter's management. It came from someone who said, there must be an interesting way for me to search throughout different streams and to see my favorite TV show or, or a political topic or my favorite band. So Twitter responds when people ask for things. LinkedIn, the world's largest social network. Is LinkedIn big in Korea? Show of hands. Who here is on LinkedIn? Okay, decent number of people. But new social networks are sprouting all the time. Pinterest, which is a photo sharing site, has a valuation of roughly $2.5 billion. It has remarkable levels of a term that I hate, engagement. People will stand for hours pinning photos, looking at other pins, liking them, creating boards. It's amazing. Now, social media has a number of major benefits. First up, it's free. Facebook doesn't charge you anything. Mark Zuckerberg has said you will never pay anything for Facebook. Okay? It costs nothing to set yourself up on Google Plus or on Twitter. Okay? But there's a difference. In the open source software world, it's one of my favorite sayings, free speech is not the same as free beer. Not that I'm advocating drinking. Tough crap. In other words, it doesn't cost any money to set up a Facebook account but to hire the people to handle Facebook, right, is going to cost some money. As Jason talked about, content marketing is absolutely huge. 
and it's typically more effective than traditional marketing. No one likes to be interrupted when you're doing what you're doing, right? But what if you could learn something? What if you weren't really trying to market to someone in a traditional way? You weren't trying to get them to make a purchase right then, right there. With content marketing, through Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter, Google+, <coughs> companies are building their brands. They're establishing relationships with their audience. They're building tribes. Think about it. People are opting in. People are asking themselves, do I want to receive this information? It's not this grape shot approach of throwing the same message at everybody. I guarantee that not everyone here likes the same things. So what if I could find the people in the blue seats and segment them from the people in the yellow seats and the people in the red seats? With content marketing, you're able to do that. You can build tribes. Now, a lot of people, when I had you stand up, said you use Google, right? There are two ways to get to the top of the Google search results, which, trust me, is a very valuable place to be. Number one is AdWords. You basically pay Google, right? I will pay per click. I will pay for placement. Now, that gets expensive very quickly. In fact, I think the record is around $10,000 US dollars to be put at the top for some very rare disease that when people search on, they almost always click for hundreds of thousands of dollars of treatment. So you can pay to play, as they say. The better way, I would argue, is the organic way. In other words, you post on the right way to market to people. And people find that post interesting, so they link to it, they tweet about it. Google elevates that naturally through page rank. Wouldn't you rather be at the top of those results? Of course you would. That's why companies spend, in some cases, millions of dollars a year on SEO or search engine optimization. One of the most underrated benefits of social media is the ability to listen, right? It's not a bullhorn, right? We're all talking about what we did last night, what we're having for lunch. That's fine. But if you're a company, you can listen to people. You're not happy with your customer service. You broke something. You, you don't want to call an 800 number and wait on hold. Listening to customers, listening for trends is a huge benefit of social media and you can respond in real time. Not too many people like it when they tweet something and that tweet is ignored. And by doing this, you build loyal customer bases. Now, if your internet goes down, which has happened to me a few times, and I've tweeted at Comcast or Cox Communications, those are companies that provide my internet, just the fact that they acknowledge me at first is huge. If you ignore me, and there's an example of ignoring people a little bit later in the presentation, you wind up earning the ire of your customers. You make them angry. And because people have a bullhorn now, and Twitter followers and things blow up, you really don't want to make one person mad, because that person can make other people mad. Concerns and risks. Here's a story of what not to do with social media. And I don't have the video, it's about four minutes long, but around four years ago, a Canadian artist, guitarist named Dave Carroll, who was in a band called Sons of Maxwell, was flying on United Airlines. And he brought his guitar with him. And his guitar wouldn't fit in the overhead. Anyone here play guitar? Just out of curiosity? Not too many, okay. So he gets to the luggage room and he picks up his guitar, and it's smashed right through the case. Dave Carroll just wanted a new guitar. He felt like the airline was at fault, and I would agree. So he called 800 numbers. He wrote emails. He wrote letters. Nothing worked. So what did he do? He bought a new guitar. And he wrote a song. You know what that song was called? United Breaks Guitars. That song received over 4 million plays. It went viral. Do you think that the people at United were upset that they didn't respond to Dave Carroll sooner? So ignoring customers is a really bad idea. Right? Social media is incredibly crowded. There are 
hundreds of millions, I would imagine, pages on Twitter. A blog gets started about every 30 seconds. It's incredibly crowded these days. In order to make an impact with social media, it's going to take time and it's going to take a little bit of luck. But these days, people like you, and we have a young audience, expect companies to be on Facebook and Twitter. We're angry when they're not responding to our tweets. So even though you may not see the immediate return on your investment, it's very important to at least have a presence. Now, no one here, of course, would cop to this, but when you allow your employees to use Facebook, they're not always going to use it for business purposes. Right? Same with YouTube. So employees can waste time. In fact, in the United States, many traditional American companies still block you from going to certain sites through services like WebSense. So you have to understand that with social media, people are going to waste time. But here's the rub. It doesn't really matter if you block them on a proper PC. Most of you are carrying around at least one smartphone or tablet. Show of hands here, does anyone not have a smartphone? I'm curious. I bet you that if we had 10 times as many people, no one would raise their hand. The ROI, or the return on investment of social media, is very difficult to calculate. Again, some executives will only do things if they can quantify the benefit or the savings. Right? Well, how do I know that I should get involved with Facebook? I have to have a 20% return on investment. That's silly. Right? How do you know? It's more important, I think, to consider what happens if you don't have a presence on social media these days. So what are some myths? Social media is easy. Sure, it's easy to start a Facebook page or to start tweeting, but doing it right actually takes some time and some thought. I am astonished in the United States how many companies don't understand some of the basics of Twitter. In fact, on my website, philsimon.com, I wrote a post called Maybe I Am a Social Media Expert. I completely agree with Jason. There are many people out there claiming to be social media experts. I don't even know what that means. But when I think about the companies that don't understand what a hashtag is, or if they tweet about you, they won't use your handle. It's just basic stuff. So many companies don't do social media particularly well. They jump in, they write a blog post, they expect the world to come coming to them, they don't, and then they give up because social media is a failure. It's not easy, it's not short, it really is a long-term effort. Also, the world is not waiting for your blog. Does anyone here not have enough to read or to watch? Does anyone not have enough friends on Facebook? We are, we are deluged with information. It is impossible to keep up. So companies need to understand that before they start tweeting, before they get on Twitter. Again, there's this notion that content marketing is the same as traditional marketing, right? I started blogging, where are my sales? I have never heard of a company that threw out a single blog post and all of a sudden received dozens or hundreds of sales. It takes time. Remember, you're building an audience, you're building a tribe. Social media, in other words, is just not the same as traditional marketing. Again, you're trying to build a conversation, you're trying to listen, you're not overtly trying to sell people things. Okay? People don't like being interrupted. I love Jason's note about the first banner ad. Um, those essentially don't work, and people finally are realizing that. The CPMs, or, or cost per thousands of banner ads, are essentially pennies on the dollar. They just don't work. People are finally realizing that the way to engage your audience is not through some cheesy banner ad, but by having a conversation with them, by educating them. Social media allows people to do that. So what are some tips? It's important to think about the long term, years, not days. Now, everyone knows who Tim Cook is, right? Okay? He is the CEO of Apple. He succeeded. Steve Jobs. Tim Cook, two months ago, joined Twitter. And within a couple of days, had four or 500,000 followers. But he's Tim Cook. He's the head of one of the most famous companies, the most iconic companies on the planet. 
your company is probably not Apple. Not good or bad, it's just true. All right. So it takes time to build a following. But Jason was absolutely right. It's wrong to just focus on number of followers. If you go to eBay, you can buy 5,000 followers for $5. They're not followers that anyone want. They're usually bots or spam accounts. So focusing on the quantity, I think, is misplaced. It's more important to focus on the quality. What do your users do? How often do they retweet? Do they comment? Do they ask questions? And yes, ultimately, do they make purchases? But even if they don't, that's OK. You never know if somebody here, if I'm speaking in South Korea, maybe some, one of you knows somebody in Las Vegas. You just don't know. Throwing things out there and experimenting is incredibly important. It is much less about a linear path to success. Experimentation is essential. Who's to say that every social media site will work? If your company sells wheelchairs to elderly people who are 70 year old, 70 years old and above, I would bet that many of your clients aren't on Facebook. It's not a bad thing. It's just not where they hang out. Right? So you shouldn't try to put a square peg in a round hole. Play with different sites. If Pinterest works for you more than Twitter, then spend more of your time and attention on Twitter. It's important to participate in conversations. Particularly on Twitter, you have what they call tweet chats with a hashtag. And smart companies realize that they should go in there not to try to hijack the conversation and to sell things to people, but to really understand what's going on and contribute. It's not terribly difficult to find out more about a company, right? One mouse click. As I said, it's important to respond to customer complaints and concern immediately. That United Airlines breaks guitar video, again, went viral. If you ignore customers, they tend to get irritated. And you don't want that. You want them to participate. If there's a problem, think about the data that customers can generate. If a 1,000 people tweet that their internet is out in Seoul, maybe there's a larger problem. Would that information help? the internet service provider solve the problem. Again, it's potentially valuable information. So to conclude, and then we'll take some questions, social media represents a new way, not only for organizations to connect with their customers, but for governments to connect with their citizens. And here's how you connect with me. It would be silly for me not to be on social media since I just spoke about it. But here I am at Twitter and my website. And I want to thank you for your time and ask some questions, answer some questions.